Uh, now I have. There we go. Right. Okay. As I said, this will be recorded and the re I'll put the recording up on YouTube and the recording will be available for later viewing. So you can rewatch whatever you need to and share it with whomever. Whole, share it with whomever you want. So I am having trouble getting rid of this chat box so that I can see my presentation. So I may need you to monitor the chat box for me. I can do that. All right. So if there's like really great stuff or really great questions, I'll need you to save me because I'll miss it. I'll do my best. All right. I get so involved in what you say, Holly. I have a hard time uh, keeping track of the chat, but I will yeah. I will monitor it to my best. That might be so it, yeah, we'll try the upper. Okay, someone's helping me. Yeah. Try view upper right and there are options. Okay, let me look. View upper right. More. Side by side, side by side gallery. All right recognize a lot of these names i do too it's a great thing it is including a number of people who are in my area in beautiful upstate new york and i oh. saw some of some of my local peeps here too so that's fun to see we just have a little uh, i think it's 7 30. yeah i like to, i like to start on time i will continue to add people Okay, I will discontinue adding people. Okay, I'll take care of that and I'll keep an eye on the chat. Perfect. And I'll keep an eye on the chat too. I, it isn't perfect, but I, I think I have it moved where it will cause the least disruption. Okay, so I'm going to introduce my all time favorite nose work coach, who is a fabulous judge and a wonderful competitor. And I am honored to be able to call her a very dear friend, Holly Bouchard. And I'm just going to turn it over to Holly and let her do the talking. And I will be in the background if anyone needs me. Well, and I would like to, as always, thank Nancy for all the things she does for the sport and nose work and all the things she does to help me meet more people and be more available and for inviting me to talk about this topic tonight. Also, thank you to the Great Barrington Kennel Club for hosting this and being willing to make this available for people for free. This is a topic that I've been excited to talk about and also fairly intimidated about talking about. I love nose work so much and the thought of getting a little bit of latitude and free space to talk about why I love it and what I think of it and some of the general things I saw without an agenda really beyond sharing that was really exciting to me. So giant thank you to Nancy for that. In many ways, this conversation and this whole topic is important to me because I feel like it's a way of honoring my late partner, Motto, because he was my teacher in this event and he was the being that showed me just how cool this sport is and how powerful it all can be. So hopefully I can say this well and be clear and add some meaning to this conversation because that's the whole point for me. So before getting started too far, let's see if I can make my slides go. I'm gonna introduce my partner, Motto, the dog that brought all of this to reality for me. Motto was a perfect partner for me because he was enthusiastic and excited and eager to play and he had some talent. So it was fun to work beside him because he brought a lot to the table. But the thing that made him really excellent is that he also had quite a few challenges. When I started nose work, I started at a weird time in my dog career where I started three dogs at the same time. So the first dog I trained in nose work happened to be Gator, Kai, and Motto all simultaneously. So I got to make all the same mistakes and do all the same things with all three dogs at once. Gator just gave me the sport. He brought his best to everything he did and it didn't matter what foolish things I might have done, he was just going to perform well because that's who he was. Kai was just a great sport so she would do the best she could, but she was always just going to kind of be obedient about it and that was just who she was. 
And then my other partner, Motto, was the one that really helped me learn a lot because Motto was imperfect in temperament, meaning he couldn't handle pressure. He would over arouse, he would worry, he would shut down. He just wasn't very forgiving. And so he's the dog that really helped me learn a whole lot about the sport. And without him and without some of the challenges that we faced together, I would have had large gaps in what I understand about training because he's the one that made me do better. So giant thank you to this partner for teaching me a lot. It's the challenging dogs that make us better trainers. And so I will always be grateful for having had that opportunity. Before we get too far into this thing, I want to make sure that the people that are joining us who don't come from the sport understand what nose work is and what scent work sports are. And nose work and scent work are games where we hunt for dirty Q-tips with our dogs. And he or she who finds the most things the fastest way without wrecking stuff wins, which is really quite interesting. It's a fun little game. It's timed. There's lots of different um, titling opportunities. Some of them are virtual where you can submit videos of you and your dog hunting for things for titles. Some are head to head where you go to shows and do this. People will gather in informal meetups that aren't sanctioned and will play together. And this is also just a fantastic enrichment game. The, the challenge of looking for scented Q-tips for dogs just tends to trigger a hunting behavior. It tends to smooth out their personalities. It tends to make them tired. And there's just lots of different ways and different venues that we can play this game. If you've not had the opportunity to watch it be played, this would be a great time to Google it, watch some YouTube videos, or go to a trial with a friend because it's just a ton of fun. So if you're brand new to this and don't know what we're doing, we are looking for Q-tips with our dogs. So the way it works when we start teaching nose work is we build value to odor by pairing it with some form of reinforcement. Whether we're building value with food or building value with play, what we do is we transfer the value that our dogs hold for some other thing to odor. And then dogs will pursue odor in order to get reinforcement. We tend to set things quite easily, the things that are obvious to the dog so they can find things until they understand that this payment can be relied on. And then we shift to more challenging puzzles. The dogs really pick up odor and transfer value pretty easily as long as we're careful with reinforcement. And the dogs will get very into this game as long as the reinforcement has meaning to them. Great advantages of this game is there's not a lot of expense. Essential oils are cheap, um, straws are free and Q-tips super, super inexpensive. We don't need a ton of equipment. You already have a leash and a long line and we can go play this game anywhere that we happen to be. So if you don't wanna do a new dog sport because you've already got $12 billion invested in playing with dogs and you've already got an A-frame out there somewhere, don't worry. A full nose work kit's not gonna cost you 30 bucks and you can play forever on it. So you have options for that for that. So just, I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time talking about the ins and outs of how this is played, but for the Barrington, the great Barrington Kennel Club members that don't already play, I thought we should cover it just a little bit. Now let's drift on to what makes this game special. This game is really different than many other sports we play with our dogs. In like many other sports, it's great physical and mental exercise. The fact that the dogs have to scent things and control their breathing and move through, through space makes this game great physical and mental exercise, but lots of sports make great physical and mental exercise for our dogs. One of the really unique things about scent work is it gives us a glimpse into how our dogs interpret and experience the world. When you are working behind a talented nose work dog, they will paint a picture of how odor is moving through the air, or how odor is collecting in grass, or how odor is rising or falling. And they'll paint this rich picture of what the odor picture is doing. And we get to, for a moment, see things that we can't see normally because the dog will show it to us through their behavior. It is super cool to get to watch how odor moves because that's not something we are able to sense for ourselves. We just, don't have the, we just don't have the physical skills or ability to do such a thing. 
And to watch a dog carefully and meticulously paint this picture and understand from hitting triangulation points how they must turn to get back to source, it really is truly magical. And it is one of the highest ways to enjoy the sport is to just let them turn something that we can't sense into a visual picture so we can attempt to understand it. People that like to play nose work with their dogs get to do more of this work in new situations. I think dogs that play nose work have an opportunity to travel more and perform this game in lots and lots of new places. Mike McManus once said that if you're always training at home, you're untraining. And I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Having to go into new environments challenges dogs to work scent puzzles in new and different ways and keeping the show on the road lets them develop their skills more fully, lets us see odor pictures more completely and helps our dogs to habituate into new surroundings more often. It's really cool. Nose work is also a game and a sport where the dog gets to be the leader. In almost all other sports that we play, it's the handler controlling the motion of the team. In rally, you don't go in there and say, go do rally. In rally, the dog has to take the cues and follow the patterns established by the handler. In agility, if the dog is choosing the course and running the course, you're not gonna qualify. Nose work is very unique in that it allows the dog to take full leadership of the game and the dog should be moving us through space the dog should be making the decisions about pacing. The dog should be deciding where we go, when we go there, and we should be honoring the dog's path and allowing them to lead. There aren't very many other places in life where we turn things over to the dog and show them that we'll follow, that we're hearing, and that we'll follow. In nose work, the best teams are the teams that have handlers that are capable of watching and listening and dogs that feel like they're being heard. Very unique to the other sports because the dog can work and turn and see that the handler is just progressing with them with every decision they make. And when the dog makes a decision that they have worked the puzzle as completely as they can and they either hold or turn or paw or do whatever their communication is, they see their handlers respond immediately to bring reinforcement to them. So the dog knows, wow, she was watching, she was watching, she's reacting to me. And I think that that's pretty magical stuff. Having the dogs know that we are interested in their language, we're interested in their work and we're investing in it makes this sport unique and special. I think it's great. Finally, I think one of the greatest gifts we give performance dogs is nose work because they get to travel and compete where they can socialize into the ring and socialize around people and dogs without any expectation that people are going to try and touch them or interact with them or force them to do anything. In nose work and scent work, the autonomy of the dog is pretty respected and the concerns of the dog are pretty respected. Dogs just don't have to interact with strangers. They just have to be in front of them and they'll be left alone. And for lots of dogs that need more ring confidence for other sports, nose work can be really helpful for that because they learn that they're going to be respected and left alone as they perform. And they can be in a pressure situation with an alien handler and in front of strangers, but no stranger is gonna try and pat their head or take them from their handler and they won't have to do be abandoned. And I think that's pretty powerful for a lot of performance dogs. I'm gonna pause here for a second, Nancy. Do you have anything you wanna add or are there any questions coming up in chat? No questions in chat yet. I did want to add this. For the people who are new to the sport, a really great free education is to find a trial and volunteer. And it's not oh, absolutely. a volunteer. You can do something like run scores. And we're hosting NACS W trials here in Ithaca at the end of September. And I've had a number of people say, well, I don't know anything about the sport. Can I come and help? And do you have something easy that I can do so I can see what's happening? And one of the, one, one of the things that I love most about nose work is that it is an incredibly welcoming sport. I remember very clearly one of my very first trials where a woman was sitting with her friends and she could tell I was a newbie because I was by myself and I was clearly making newbie mistakes and she included me in her group and she has been incredibly kind to me 
and generous and open-hearted and open-handed since then. We all, those of us in the sport, all try to be the same way to newbies because you guys are the future of the sport. So come on into the light, find a local trial. You can go on the AKC website and Google your area or go to NACSW and look at the trial calendar and come and watch, come and join the fun. You can learn a tremendous amount simply by volunteering, even if you're an experienced competitor. Yeah, absolutely. There is no better education than having the opportunity to watch a bunch of great teams play. No better way to learn, no better way to get feel the excitement. Huge, huge teacher. Still no questions, so that's all right. Go. Yep. Yet. So I'm going to go ahead. Oh, it looks like we've got someone popping and I'll let you read that while I continue on. Okay, so she says, I second the value, the value of volunteering as an educational opportunity. I learned so much from judges and experienced handlers. NW people are friendly. Yes, we are. Yes. Come into the light. Come into the light. Come in, yes. And really in terms of crowds of people, I, I, come, from, I come from agility, obedience, and rally, and trick dogs, and CGCs, and all of that. And I love all of the sports. I really do. But I have to say nose work people tend to be much more supportive because there are ways that everyone at the trial can win. It is in some ways less competitive. Unless you're trying for first through fourth, everyone can qualify by beating the course. And so it tends to be just a cohesive, dog loving, joyful, supportive group of people. I don't think it's, it's not easy to find a nicer group of dog people than there is at, at nose work sports. And the president of GBKC reminds us that we are hosting our trials this coming weekend in Peru, Mass at Perfect. Camp Sanby. So I hope to see some of you there. Perfect. So as I've played this game, I've, I'm going to backtrack in a minute and talk about some of my progression through the sport. But I have been in the, playing this game for quite a while, and I was a canine handler a million years ago. And through all these changes, I've come to believe that I have three primary roles in nose work as a handler. I believe my job is to set puzzles and challenges so that my dogs can learn through experience and experimentation, that my dog can self-train because of the challenges I put before them. I believe it's my job to use reinforcement wisely. That means it should be accurate, it should be timely, it should have high impact, the dog should want it. And I believe it's my job to ride softly behind my dog's shoulder. I think those are my three primary roles in the sport. And every decision I make in training and all that I do builds off of those concepts. I believe that's the core of what I owe. I should be presenting good challenges, using reinforcement wisely, and walking softly behind my dog's shoulders. So not everyone believes those three cores, but those are the three cores that inform almost all of my decision-making and my handling when I work the dogs that I own and when I do my coaching. So I think that's sort of an interesting conversation point to have. I think if you asked a room full of 20 handlers what their core beliefs about their role was, you'd get very different answers from different handlers. And they'd all be valid and they'd all be interesting. And I think if we'd take the time to answer that question, we'd understand the filter that we're applying and we'd understand each other a little better and know how we see the sport from different perspectives. I think it's a great little question to ask. So I thought I would go ahead and just answer that early in the talk so that you know that that's the lens that I'm viewing the sport from. When I started in nose work, I started when I was about 12, apparently. I was actually <laughs> <laughs> I was actually 30 or so in this picture. But I started as a canine handler and that was my first partner, Jake. And I learned to do the nose work game by handling a, a scent detection dog. So because that was how I started, I started handling in a very specific way. I was very heavy in my handling, meaning I presented things. I didn't allow the dog much freedom. I limited where my dog could search. I made my dog search on linear lines and search up and down Vs. My dog searched on a four foot leash on a choke chain. And in his entire career, he never got a cookie for work. 
I never, he got snacks just to get snacks, but he never got food at all in training. He would work for a squeaky tennis ball or a laser light, but he would not work. I didn't give him food in his work. And so my genesis in the sport was as a highly, highly controlling handler who presented in a very specific way, who didn't believe food belonged in that picture. And with a joke chain on a four foot line, I mean, it's a crazy place to start from. So that was where I started from. Over time, I found out that that probably wasn't the only way to play the game because there were all sorts of people being very successful looking for food in boxes and letting their dogs lead and doing all sorts of different things. I thought a lot of that was crazy. It didn't make any sense to me. I didn't know why you wouldn't want to have a systematic approach to a search area. I didn't know why you'd want the dog to run higgledy piggledy all over the place. I didn't know if putting out cookies and hunting for cookies would make a dog just want cookies. And I had to do a whole lot of learning and part of what helped change things for me were these silly little whippets that I had who wouldn't tolerate being put on a choke chain and shown what to do. They just weren't very interested in doing obedience with a scent game at the end of it. That just didn't move them. So I started playing and learning behind these dogs that I had. And the best thing that ever happened to me is this dog, Mato, who was really into the sport and won his first nw1 and was competitive in nw2 and got his nw3 and four tries back when you had to have a hundred percent and won his second elite trial i mean he was just doing great all of a sudden he quit it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me and my understanding of the game because we ended up going out of town to a trial and i'd say find it and he'd just stand there and look at me and i was flabbergasted because this was a dog that loved the game. This was a dog that was well-prepared. He'd won some trials and now he doesn't want to play anymore. And we were missing things and it didn't make sense that we were missing things. And I got really curious about why all of this was happening. And I got very, very lucky. I posted a video on, a, on one of the Facebook groups that talks about nose work and said, why is my dog broken? What do you think happened? And I had a great trainer pop in and say, do you really want to know? <laughs> and I said, yes. And she said, is it okay if I tell you publicly? And I said, sure. <laughs> and that was a little scary because I knew I was probably volunteering for some feedback that was maybe going to cut a little close to home. And Sue Sternberg took the time to go through some of my videos line by line, showing all the ways that I was taking the enjoy and enthusiasm away from my dog, reducing his leadership, imposing my will, and controlling the search. And it was one of the greatest gifts I've ever been given in the sport because all of a sudden I could see that while I thought I was helping or I thought I was adding structure or order to the search, what my dog was experiencing was being questioned, undermined, directed, and told on how to do a job that I couldn't do without him. And that was super powerful, really, really helpful to show me that there was a different way to play this game than the way I had been playing it when I was handling, like I was handling a, scent uh, handling a narcotics detection dog. That was super powerful. Along the way, I had Jeff McMahon uh, I attended a couple of his sniff, sniff overs, and those were super fun because he would present outrageous puzzles that forced handlers to learn things behind their dogs that he didn't necessarily intend to teach. He just pushed teams out of their comfort zone and let them experiment and learn the lessons that were available to them through that experience. I found the voices of the McManuses. I did some coaching under Leah Gangelhoff. And I had a really great student, Ramona, teach me with, through her dog how important it was to be respectful of the dog because like Motto, her dog Jazz was super sensitive to any time the handler got a little out of balance. And we had to learn how to stay respectful of their need for autonomy. And if we didn't, the dogs would quit. So just a ton of learning that happened through there. And I will always be grateful for it. I see we're missing, picking up some things in chat, Nancy. What do we have? Yeah, we talked, um, Mary, 
Mary and her beagles mentioned talks a little bit about how this is this sport has been the one that has been most welcoming and then she really encourage encourages people to volunteer. And Maureen talks about how that's how my dog learned his first year taught by a police dog trainer and he loved the game and the attention. And then somebody asked about whether or not you could go back and talk a little bit more about how the sport started. So perhaps if we have time at the end, you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and if you play a little online and it's NECSW that started this and it was started for shelter dogs and dogs that had uh, some dogs that had some reactivity issues and the core founders had history and detection work. It's a pretty interesting story, but it's a story that probably the founders should tell themselves so that I don't misstate it for them. It's, it's a great story with a great origin and I will always be grateful to them for making this available to pet people and to making it a sport. Anytime you give ribbons for something, you increase interest in that something. So I'm so grateful that that happened. Shall I continue on? Yes, please. Yeah. All right. So now that I have learned to walk softly behind my dog's shoulder, and now I'm always going to be a student of that. I always make mistakes. What has become more and more interesting to me is that I want to have this picture of what I want my game to look like. And I care about the picture more than I care about the results. So for me, this means when I go into a search, it's not about how many hides did we find. It's about how did we find those hides? I very much want my dog to be making all of the big decisions. I don't mind if I make a subtle suggestion here and there, or I restrain the leash a little bit so that we get coverage in a new area, or I wait to call finish until my dog has flowed into another region. All those things are great. But what I want is I want the perception of the dog driving the search and of me flowing behind the dog and the dog having that bright leadership. I want the game to look like hunting. I want it to look like the dogs working for gophers or squirrels in the backyard. I want that brightness. I want that animation. I want that autonomy. And for me, that's what's important in nose work now. It's not important that we get the things. It's important that we get the things with the dog driving and the dog making those decisions. Jeff McMahon said an interesting thing during a session I had with him as I was preparing for Summit, and he called nose work a horse race. He says, it's just a horse race. And at, when he said it, it I, I recorded that he had said such a thing, but I hadn't processed what it meant. And as time has passed, and as I've thought about it more, I can't say that I know exactly what, I me what he meant, but I can tell you what I think it means. There are dogs that are going to just be faster. There are dogs that are going to just be better. There are dogs that just have been gifted a reserve of talent and a reserve of speed, and they are going to win more trials than other dogs. It's just a horse race. Where the magic is, is in the how did we do it? How did we get there? What hours did we train? What happened to the relationship? How much did the dog handler learn to hear the language of the dog? For me, that's where the magic of this game comes in, more so than just being the fastest. Now, the pursuit of being faster will spend, make us spend more time with our dogs, make us train better, and great, thing ha great things happen along the way with that. But the point of it isn't to get more hides. The point of it is to get more brightness from the dog and to have this relationship deepening and to have this experience that the dogs get to have of the leadership and the play and this time spent together in new places. That's what ends up being important in the end. In my heart, it's always gonna be just about the run. The re results always take care of themselves, but the run is what's important. When teams coach with me and they're getting ready to trial, one of the things I ask of them if they're willing to do it is trial day. I want them to define at max three goals for the day that they can evaluate the success or failure of their day based on the outcome of these three goals. And these three goals have to be entirely under their control. So you can't say, I wanna find one more hide 
I want to be first place. I want to, you know, you can't call things that we can't control. But what I want people to do is to have three objectives that they want to meet on the day. And that might be something as simple as start my timer, keep my toes oriented to my dog, call finish the second time my dog looks at me or something like that, depending on whatever the, the skill of the team or the challenges of the team are, find three performance goals that aren't outcome based that we can define the success of the day on. And that has been really helpful and magical for teams because now no matter what the final result of the day is, you can evaluate whether or not you have continued to progress as a team based on those performance goals that you set for yourself. All the value should be in the run, not in the outcome of that run. I think that can be a really helpful way to process information at a trial and to keep focused on the things that matter. If we focus on the performance things, the outcome takes care of itself. If we're focused only on the outcome, we'll probably make process decisions that are gonna undermine us as a team. So being concentrating on running as clean and as well as we can is so much more important than trying to chase the ribbon. I think competing is fantastic. I love nose work. I love nose work sports. Isn't this a pretty picture? And I think we have just a ton of fun out there and I love it. However, I do think there's things that we have to be a little bit careful about when we compete because I think competition forces us sometimes to make bad decisions in favor of trying to get ribbons or results. And I think that that can be a problem. Not all dogs are meant to compete. Um, there's a ton of dogs out there who don't enjoy competition that really enjoy nose work just because they don't like the pressure or they don't like the traveling or they don't feel comfortable in front of the crowd. And some dogs just can't handle the pressure that their handlers put on them when they start competing. You and I, Nancy, know handlers that are very nice and fantastic at home and in training. They do a great job. And then when they get to a trial, it's like some alien takes over <laughs> and it becomes, find yeah. it, find it, check here. Look, hurry, hurry, find it, check. And all of us do that to some degree. I have an alien handler within me that leaks out when I compete that I have <laughs> to fight all times because it does, it just comes out of us. And I have footage of me doing all the things. It's just not helpful. And so when we compete, we have to be really careful to make sure that we aren't changing and, and ruining the thing that we're building in practice and letting this thing happen to us when we, when we get there in front of a crowd. Any thoughts to add on that? I, I indeed, indeed I do. I am very grateful that you took me under your wing because I was one of those heavy handlers. And in my, I run defecators for those of you who don't know me. And in our last few elite trials, I let my boy dog run off leash. You know, I have a deaf dog. I can't, I can't control him. I can't communicate with him unless I'm connected by a leash. And I thought, Elitist and NACSW elite is just such a wonderful level. I figured, so what? You know, he doesn't find any hides. Well, the worst thing that can happen is we can get to go through it to a few more trials. Yay. And absolutely. And every time I let him run off leash, he found every single hide. And that to me was profound because what was I doing to hold him back? There I was, thought I thought I was helping him and I was actually getting in his way. It's not that he didn't find every single hide in other searches, but every time I let him run off leash, he found everything. That was a very profound lesson for me. Almost everything we think we're doing to help makes things harder for them because we're processing that search area through our visual, through our visual, right. through our sense of order and our sense of visual and most dogs solve things circularly mm -hmm. and we block that. We don't mean to, but we block that. And when they are given the freedom to twist and turn and back and move however they need to, they show us that vision and scent are not the same. And it is so powerful to be able to let them have that the way they want to and to see the difference when we do. And that, my friend, is why I'm so grateful you took me under your wing, because it's made a profound difference for my dogs. Gator, 
Yeah. So I always, since I, this seems like a fair place to talk about this, competing is good. Competing is fine. Competing is not fine if it's not good for the dog. And how we compete is of, is of critical importance. This picture was taken 12 hours before Gator died. We competed all day and he won these ribbons all day and he died that night after that trial. And one of the things I've always been so grateful for is he had a ball at the trial. He loved being there. He enjoyed it. He led, he had fun. He had a great day. And so I don't have any regrets that that's how he spent the last day. And I'm quite confident if I had asked him, how do you want to spend it? He just said, uh, let's go to a dog show and then go hiking. And that's what he did. But it serves as sort of this cautionary tale. Let's not put these dogs under a bunch of pressure that we're going to regret later. It was amplified because of how quickly things changed for us. But all of us are only given a certain number of days with our dogs. And I never want to look back and go, wow, I wish I hadn't done that with them. I was showing my older Whippet, Kai, at an elite trial last fall. It was about a year ago right now. And we went into the first search and she didn't look great. And we went into the second search. She didn't want to be there. And I put her in the car and went home after two searches. I'm confident we could have gotten our points, but it made no sense to me when my dog said, this isn't what I want to be doing today. It made no sense to me to stay and try and change that because it felt disrespectful to her history of training together and her willingness to have been my partner. It seemed like she was saying, please don't ask this of me. And I have always been proud that I went okay. And I, I got her out of there. I think that we should always be in tune because I don't have that regret with, with Gator because he was glad to go do it. But when Kai said, please no, we just loaded up and went home. If trialing isn't good for my dog, I have some choices. The choices should be to go back into training and into acclimating and fix whatever the problem is in training and then bring them back out or stop trialing. But I don't think it's fair to beg them to trial when they're asking not to. I think ribbons aren't why we get dogs. We don't get dogs as ribbon getters. We get them as partners. And if our partners are asking us for to stop, we should hear them. They should be allowed that voice. So I always look at this picture of Gator and I'm always pleased that I was able to hear Kai when she had a different, when she had a different voice than he had when she was complaining about the sport. So there are a couple of comments and questions about dogs that are fine until they get on shiny floors or hardwood floors. And mm -hmm. I'm not absolutely sure that this is the forum to address those issues. Well, we can talk briefly about it because I do have an idea. If we know our dog has those issues, we have choices and we have a bunch of choices. Choice one is to take, tackle that as an acclimation issue in training, which would mean purchase segments of that floor, feed, uh, you know, feed on a 12 foot, 12 inch square, make it a four, 24 inch square, make it a 36 inch square. If we really want to do that or take them places and, and, use food to help acclimate them separate from the sport. First, you do all the acclimation separate from the sport. And you can still trial while your dog has these issues, but if you get to the trial and you see that you have a shiny floor, you pull. Right. You just pull, it's right. okay, you just pull. I'm just not gonna run on that. Um, we'll run the other searches and stinks that that cost me 50 bucks, but here we go. So I, I think that first the answers are always handle that separate from the odor picture. Don't, don't put nose work with that. Just, just train that separately. And then if you get to a trial and there's an environment that's too much, just get out of there. You don't have to do every run. It's okay to say no. I went into a container search once and there was a big stuffed dog staring at the start line over top of the containers. And I had one dog that I knew didn't understand he, he knew how to work around stuffed dogs, but he didn't know how to work around that stuffed dog staring at the start line. And I just said, I'm not running my dog with that dog staring at the start line. I'm not asking that. And you just pull and it's okay. It's okay to just say, nah. And so if you have a slick floor, is there a part of the search area that doesn't have a slick floor? Search that and then call finish. 
search that, see if your dog will willingly go in. The last summit search I did with Motto was in an airplane up a thin flight of stairs. And I was standing in the parking lot talking to people and we were going, how are we going to get our dogs up those stairs? And I said, I'm not even going to ask it. I'm going to walk up to it. And if he takes the steps, we go. And if he doesn't, we don't. And I'm not even going to ask him to do that. And I think it was the fact that I didn't ask it that gave my dog the courage to try it. And he went up on his own. But had he said not doing that, we just weren't going to do the airplane search. Ends up being the only placement ribbon we got on the day. So I'm very grateful that he chose to go up. But I was absolutely flabbergasted that he decided to do that for me. Because earlier in the trial, he was scared to go up some steps into a bus. And when he said, I can't do this, I called finish and walked him off. Don't ask them to do what they can't do. They didn't sign up for the game. We did. And so we hear what they're saying and, and honor that. And we'll get to play another day. I think that's all good. I think that's some of the best advice that I have ever heard. Honor the dog. Just honor the dog. So in the end, these runs that we do in practice are often the runs that mean the most to us. This picture was taken um, on a training day when a couple of my students um, rented this little Halloween area and set hides for me to practice summit. And we ran searches all day in this crazy, scary, haunted land with goats and all sorts of little animals floating around. And ultimately, this was the most fun I ever had searching a dog. In terms of the highlight reel of the greatest moments of nose work with my partner, this was it. Now this moment was caused by competition because I was preparing for competition and that's why we got this great space and had this great experience. But it wasn't the competition that made it wonderful. It was the training hours that did it. And I am so deeply grateful that I have this memory and that I had friends willing to do that and that I was willing to just truly enjoy that opportunity and have so much fun playing with that dog. Make sure that the journey is the part where we make the investment. The trials are just the icing on the cake. It's the training and the hours together, the great places and the friendship that matter. Competition in the end gives us more hours of practice. We certainly work harder at something where we feel competitive. It's a lot easier to care when we think we may end up winning a ribbon or, or getting a title. So I think competition is great for dogs in that it helps us practice with more intensity. We go more places, we meet more people, we travel, we come up with a memory reel. And in the end, we get all of these fabulous photos and all of these fabulous videos and all of these great experiences that we were able to share with our team. Looking back on the trip we took to Estes Park, I mean, Motto and I went to Estes Park. We hiked in the mountains. We did, we, he swam in rivers. We, we had absolutely the grandest, best time. And I'm so grateful for that. And all of that happened because we pursued, we pursued a title. It was because we were competing that we went on the road. I remember the nights when we would go to Chicago, which was so different than the country home I have where I live with my dogs. And what I would do at night before a trial to get my dogs used to the weird smells and the weird scents and the weird, just the weird place is we'd go for these night walks and just listen to Chicago, listen to sirens, listen to cars, take it all in. And what great memories of just walking in that area to help dogs get used to the feel of a new region. All the hotel trips, all the friends made along the way, just fantastic stories. And that's what competition brings to the table when we decide to compete in nose work with our dogs and what a, what a treasure that is. I think that the few things that I worry about when I think about competition are people that will start really young dogs really early in their sport before they've really had time to grow up. If a seasoned dog that has been around alive for five years has a bad experience in a trial, most of them will shake it off because they have all this life experience and go, that wasn't good, but usually life is good, so it's okay. If we bring a young dog into an event and they have a bad experience, they don't have that big file of optimism to call on. They go, wow, this is scary. And they don't know that 
it isn't always scary. It was just a weird thing. So I think young dogs can be a little bit more fragile. I also think they're easier to burn out because they bring all this enthusiasm and they bring all this energy and that's fun. But if we ask too much of them, we'll see them dim over time instead of deepen and brighten over time. So I think we've got to be really careful with young dogs when we decide we want to compete. I think we have to be very careful of fearful dogs. I think we have to ask ourselves, is this a fair ask? Would the dog choose to be here? If I was hearing my dog's voice, what would they say? I think we also have to be very careful of the pressure that we put on dogs in competition. Ribbons make us crazy. I don't know why, but ribbons make us crazy and ribbons make me crazy. So I'm a fellow sinner on the road to craziness with ribbons, so I get it. The other thing I think is now that there are so many different venues to compete in, I think it's easy to get out of balance with our dogs. I think it's easy to trial too much. And now all of a sudden, all the investment we should be putting into training that we then go test and trialing, we're just testing, 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 and our training erodes because we aren't putting enough money back into that to keep the dog's behaviors fluent and fluid and keep them strong and keep them optimistic. You can see dogs that are starting to dim as they trial too many weekends in a row and we get sloppy about our alert calls. We get sloppy about criteria. We get sloppy about all sorts of things. And so I think getting out of balance is a real concern when we are looking at dogs and looking about whether competition is great for us or not. One of the new questions I've been asking myself in nose work, and it's an interesting time to admit this, is I want a tattoo on my arm. What if I'm wrong about everything? I find that I have been changing so many of my thoughts about the sport and I'm looking at different things. I'm looking at things through different lenses and I'm really critically thinking about all the things I do and all the things I take for granted. I think it's great to be open to the idea that you might be wrong about your assumptions. When I first started training in nose work, I really didn't understand pairing. I thought pairing was lunacy. I did. I just, it wasn't my, wasn't my brand. And now I do it all the time. I do it casually. I paired a bunch of hides for Kai today. And I look at that and think, I wonder how many other things I'm wrong about. When I first started the sport, I thought presentation and sequencing and coverage was really important. And now I think coverage is kind of a, irrelevant. The dogs will do the coverage they need to do as long as I bring them in as prepared as I should. I look at that and think, wow, all the things I've been wrong about, all the things I've learned. And so I found a clothing line, which is ridiculous. And the clothing line says, honor the dog. And she also has stickers that stay, say, stay curious. All this stuff matches part of the attitude I like to bring into nose work, this adventuresome openness that means let's just keep evaluating everything and adjusting in real time and keep learning and keep being curious. And so I want to give a call out to uh, Leah Gangelhoff and her stay curious stuff and her honor the dog stuff, because I think when we hang those things on our fridge and wear those things on our chest on a shirt, it's really easy for us to stay students of the sport instead of trying to become bosses of the sport and think we know much. I think that's really fun. Being open to new concepts, new ideas, being open to learning is so huge in this sport. Nose work, even though it's been around a little while, is still really new. And we're only beginning to scratch the surface of what we ought to know. So stay open, keep learning, take in voices, be kind to the dog, always honor the dog, always stay curious, and always be open to the fact that maybe we're wrong. In the end, nose work is great, but we get dogs to share our lives. Let's make sure that our nose work efforts expand on how we share our lives with our dogs and don't replace some of that. Nose work is fantastic. It's a great way to open doors. It's a great way for enrichment. We can do it anywhere. The dogs love it. It's good for letting them be leaders. It's good for showing them that they're heard. It's a natural endeavor. It is magical to watch them show us what odor can do. But in the end, these are our, these are our pets. These are our friends. These are our family. Keep it in balance. Don't get a dog to do better in nose work. Do nose work with whatever dog you found on your couch. Bring this into that relationship and grow as much as you can within that team. Every dog, every partner is our teacher. 
be open to what they can teach us, be open to what they can show us, much, much more magical than just trying to win some ribbons. So that's all I had prepared for tonight. I am happy to stay and, and share some ideas and answer some questions. We do have a couple of comments and a couple of questions. Okay. And, uh, somebody mentions that they were at a trial on a farm and a donkey walked over to check out what was going on. The, the awesome. dog actually, the dog got back to work. And I have, for the been, dog. I have been in that position because I was at an elite trial with my girl dog, Keo, and a feral cat went running under her nose and she went, cat! And then she caught odor and she went, odor! odor. And went right back <laughs> to work, which is amazing because Akitas have extremely high prey drive. I don't think awesome. my boy dog would do that, but Keo sure did. That's awesome. And, and there, there was a question. Any tips for working about with deaf dogs? And I handle deaf dogs, so you, I'm, you take that. I, I am welcome. You, I, I, you take that. I, I PM'd her, and I'm, I'm happy to work with, make suggestions to people who have deaf dogs. I'd like prefer to do that outside of this presentation because I'd like you to be the focus of this. And somebody very cleverly, when you were talking about ribbons and comments ribbons can be ordered yes they Thanks, can Cindy. they <laughs> can, can be ordered and there's a question about how do handle residual odor their trials are held at the same place we do training and there are lots of other dog training and trials are held there and there's loads of, loads of spot with residual scent and dog pee everyone's favorite dog pee I'm Absolutely. in Australia and it is extremely difficult to get venues to hold trials. Welcome to my world because I like to host trials. And woo, this the club is the only place to trial for a thousand kilometers. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty intense. So in in so the residual odor question, do we know it's residual odor or is the dog alerting and you don't know it's residual odor, so you're stuck? I I, I would need clarification on that. Uh, recently, we had a trial where the dog in the demons, the first dog in the run order, who was the demo dog, or the dog in white, or the first run, you know, whatever terminology your organization uses for the dog that is used to test the search area, there was a hide that the dog could that the the first dog, the demo dog, couldn't find, and the decision was made to remove that hide and change the search. So we pulled the hide put a blue X where the hide had been. So if another dog were to hit it, the handler would know that that isn't an intended hide, but there was a hide there. And the right thing to do for residual odor on that, in my opinion, is if the dog hits that blue X, just feed the dog, don't call the hide and move on. If the dog says there's enough odor here that it met their criteria for a hide, feed them and move on. But if we're talking about residual odor that isn't marked that the handlers don't know anything about, that's pretty tough. That's really tough. I am not a fan of training dogs not to hit residual odor. My own bias is if they can find, they can work it from the air and trace it back to source, that meets my criteria for what should be alerted on. And I know other trainers feel differently about that, but if it's still there and the dog works it back and the dog can source it, I feed that. So it's gonna just depend, you know, there's trainers that say if it isn't an active hide with a tin and a Q-tip, sh they shouldn't alert. I would go train with those folks if the question is, how do I teach them not to hit residual odor because that isn't where I invest my training time. Another comment about, she was at, this woman was at a trial with her dog, several feral cats, and they competed in an equine barn. Yes, trials yep. can be held anywhere. Lots of those, yeah. Yes. I, I am fortunate enough to have access to the Cornell Vet School and we train there, my group trains and I train there a lot. And because of that, our dogs tend to be fairly bomb proof. We hosted sure. trials there just before COVID, pre-COVID. And you could tell dogs that we're not used to working in that environment. And it is a challenging environment, very challenging. Yeah, yeah. I was judging an elite trial and there were three goats that kept jumping out of the pens and running through searches <laughs> oh and they just actively loose goats. And I mean, it stinks, but it's life. Man. It, happens. it is. It happens. We, my friend Barb was, was competing and a, it was St. Patrick's day and a group of drunk people singing went through the search area 
these things happen. It's not, <laughs> yes. it's not church. It's not church and it's not fair. And if you want fair, nose work is probably not your gig because it's never going to be fair. Right. That's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. Sometimes it rains on one of you. Sometimes the wind starts. Sometimes the wind stops. Sometimes the heights go dead. It is one of the more random sports that we play. Fair is a small part of it. Not, not a lot of fair. I would agree with that. Yeah. A couple of comments about best dog sport ever, whether you compete or not. Love, love, love. Thank you, Nancy and Holly. Beautiful presentation. Love this webinar. So insightful about honoring your dog. Love it. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Oh. What and a thank you for attitude. having us. And absolutely, I agree wholeheartedly, which is one of the many reasons I love Holly. Yes, residual on Velcro used previously to hold hide. That was the woman who asked about residual odor. You Any, call it and pay it and get out of there. It's yeah, life. Take the no, yeah. Any tips for take blowing no. odor working outside in the wind? Do it, then do it again, then do it again, and let your dog show you how to work it. Dogs just, the dogs, usually we overthink that. If we let the dogs work through that, wind tends to be their friend. Let yeah, the dogs sure just is. keep running, yeah. keep getting outside, keep keep running in it. Yeah, the wind is their friend. Air yep. movement is your dog's friend. Yep. She has a, there's a dog that's very environmentally and pressure sensitive. Best things that happened to us was that the lottery system slowed us way down. Yes, amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, it takes yeah. three years to get through NW1 and NW2. I actually ended up with a dog who was pretty bomb proof. Good for That's you. Fantastic. Yeah, good for you for respecting your dog. One of the yeah. saddest things that I see as a judge is this the dog is terrified of a bathroom or the floor or something in the room. And the handler is, come on, search, search, search. Let's just search. Let's just search. Let's just search. I find that sad. I yeah. find that sad because you're pushing your dog past their limits. And to me, it's not respecting and honoring your dog sufficiently. That's my two cents. And it's interesting, but lots of times as a judge, I'll be in an area and I'll see an area that I can see would be concerning. Yes. And I'll, in, I'll intentionally avoid it. Yes. So it's in the search area, but I don't put anything there because right. I can see abundantly that that's going to be a source of concern. So none of my hides are in that spot anyway. And then you'll see the handlers that force the coverage into it and they'll miss the hide somewhere else because they focused on the thing that they were worried about rather than just search what was available to them. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's interesting to watch that. And I'm sure I've done it too. I'm sure I've done it too. It's just, it's not, it's not good for the dog. Somebody says, I thought you were about to say drunk goats. Drunk goats. <laughs> they probably were. <laughs> Let's go with that. It's a better a, story. A, a lot of thanks. Another awesome yes. webinar. I'm inspired to reemphasize joy rather than precision. Good for you. If you emphasize joy, precision will come. If Absolutely. you emphasize precision, the reverse is not true. More thanks, more thanks, more thanks. And I want to do a quick thank you. Um, I got permission from Caprice Adams to use all of those competition photos. The candids are mostly mine, the, you know, the backyard shots, but the, those gorgeous competition photos are all from Caprice. And I can't possibly thank her enough for giving me the, you know, I have these photos now for my lifetime to have these fantastic moments. And these photos mean so much to me. I am so grateful to have them. Know, if you ever have the chance to buy your photos and to buy your videos, get them. I can tell you they, they're worth it. Entirely. Absolutely worth it. Entirely. My yep. girl, yeah, my girl is pretty old and she's pretty riddled with arthritis. And while we do play the game, we don't compete. She still loves it. And I'm so grateful to be able to go back and watch her when she was in her prime. Yeah, when they when if we're buying the videos in real time and watching them, they're so great much. teaching tools. Sure. We learn we learn so much. But then in his, historically, when we go back and look at them, they're just such a comfort and such a source of joy. So they serve two purposes. First, you can't beat the education and the information that's available to you through them. But then finally, having them as a memory, really powerful stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And I video all training and that's great to watch and learn from. Yes. 
Absolutely. Yes, indeed. We do, we do video days. And then yep. as a group, we go over the videos and everybody learns from everybody else. Yeah. Yep. And the more, one of the greatest gifts you can give a crew is to have five to five or six teams run the same search blind, videotape yes. it, and then go watch each other's videos. And, and just, there's so much to be learned from watching dogs working the same puzzle after the fact. It's, it's, there's just no better way to mine for information. Really cool stuff. Absolutely. If you don't play this game, you should play this game. Even if you just, even if you just tinker with it. My happiest, my happiest times with the dogs. I've had a big day. I'm exhausted. I have nothing to give them. I go in the backyard, throw three tins and go get them back. And my dogs are at the door. They sound like frogs chirping trying to get their turn and they, they want it so badly. And all they need is just five minutes or three minutes or a couple minutes just to run and smooth out. It just is so satisfying to them. It brings them such pleasure. So many of our sports they'll do for us. Mm -hmm. This one, I think we owe, I think this is one we should do for them. I agree. It just is, it's different enough. They love it enough. This one, this one's for them and it, it brings them such pleasure. Even if we don't intend to compete, just allowing them to show us this and to be heard and to lead and, and to pursue. It's so enriching. It means so much to them. It's not a big ask. You never have to go and compete for ribbons if you don't want to, but man, the dogs find so much pleasure in it. I think we should give it to them. I agree wholeheartedly. And that's why I tell people, come into the light. Come <laughs> the light. Join the crowd. Join the Come crowd. into the odor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. And it is all about joy. This is, it, is. it, it makes my dog, dogs happy. I mean, I mean, yep. Physiologically, 40% of a dog's brain is associated with the sense of olfaction. And when they get paid for using their best sense and they're free to run around and use their best sense, it is, it's about yeah. joy for them. Yep. Yep. Any other a renewal webinar? Sure. And indeed, lots and lots and lots of thanks and to emphasize yeah. joy and that, that joy will bring um, precision. Yep. It will. It sure will. So thank you, Nancy, for your tireless efforts on the part of this. You give so much of yourself online. I really appreciate the chance to talk. So well, thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Oh, and Tater, Tater's person is here. Are you the Tater I got to watch all weekend? I hope so. Tater's adorable if you're my CPE Tater from last weekend. Great to see everybody. And I'm sure we'll see you soon. I, I think I'm doing some webinars with you, Nancy, coming up yes. later this month, yep. one a month for the next four months. So, oh, good. That is, that is that tater. That's awesome. So where can they find information about that if they want to continue with me? Just email me at Ithaca. I'll put it in the chat. Ithaca.nosework.work at gmail.com. Um, or they can look at, just look at your nosework pages. Yep. Ithaca knows work page, the Brainy K9, those places have it posted. And or hang on. There you go. Now people have access to that. Good. Or friend Holly or I on Facebook. I'm under the Brainy K9, and we have it. We'll be posting it there if it hasn't been posted. Yeah, and do it through Nancy because she handles all of that. I, I do the background don't, stuff. It's, it's the I don't know how to do that. I T H A C A. I T H A C A. I think it knows work. Awesome. And Dana and Tater, you were awesome. So no apology. No, no dorky. No apologies. You guys were great. You guys are fun to watch. Add the dots. Take a look at what I'm typing. Ithaca. I can't see it. So. All right. Ithaca dot <laughs> work at gmail.com. Or just go to the website www.brainyk9.com. That's not posted now, but I'll when we get off this, after I get this going so I can get this up on YouTube and I'll post this on various Facebook pages, I will make sure that the sign up sheet is. Oops, I'm sending it to the wrong people. Um, send it to everybody, everyone. Um, 
I'll make sure that the sign up sheet and the information about your webinars are on my website. Awesome. There we go. Now it's up. But I don't think any of the chat appears in the recording. So, no. So we'll have to figure that all out. The recording will be made available as always. The recordings are available and they will be posted at the Brainy Cane on it and Facebook and on Holly's Facebook page and other places as I can post it. Awesome. All right. Any other Thanks, questions? everybody. I don't think so. All right. Have a great evening, everyone. And thank you again, Holly, for... And thank you again, Nancy and everybody. It's Holly, fun. Nose Work brought you into my life and made us friends. So I will Isn't that always, awesome? I know it is. I will always be grateful <laughs> to this sport. Me too. Me too. All right. Have a great All right. evening, folks. Yep. Good night. Good night now.